Good afternoon. I'm John Petey, Chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. The NEH is a federal agency dedicated to funding research, education, preservation, and public programs in the humanities. Since 1965, the NEH has invested in thousands of projects that illuminate the history of our nation. As we have just heard earlier, the latest re report card reveals a disappointing decline in knowledge in U.S. history and our overall low scores in civics among eighth grade students. Historical illiteracy in our youth has grave societal implications. For if one does not understand the founding ideals of our nation, then it is difficult to grow into a fully engaged citizen. We cannot ask our young adults to defend representative democracy unless we ensure first that they have a foundational understanding of its roots. As Thomas Jefferson said, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and will never be. Historical illiteracy will ultimately result in failures of domestic and foreign policy and in an economically weaker nation that is no longer a leader in innovation much less a leader, leader in humanistic areas such as moral reasoning and ethics. We must do everything we can as public officials, educators, and parents to ensure that we do not live in a bifurcated America where in-depth civics education and broad civic engagement are no longer a given. The Department of Education and NEH and other federal agencies cannot change this cultural drift ourselves but we can make catalytic investments in those schools and civic organizations and projects that are trying to turn this trend around. As our nation approaches its 250th anniversary in 2026, NEH is devoting substantial resources to our new grant program, A More Perfect Union, and to the history and civics grants highlighted today. More than 20 years ago, NEH launched Excitement, a pioneering free educational website with hundreds of lessons plans, teacher's guides, and student activities from the American Revolution to the Civil Rights Movement. It is used by more than 1.5 million teachers and homeschool parents each year. More than half a million students participate in National History Day annually, a program that NEH has supported since 1977. Connecting students to primary source materials, the program fires the imagination and strengthens the intellect of its participants. NEH is also a strong supporter of iCivics. Founded by retired Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, iCivics offers online lesson plans and educational games that make learning about government interesting and fun. Last year, NEH and the Department of Education awarded $650,000 to iCivics to support the development of a new roadmap for history and civics education. NEH has helped to preserve Native American languages and cultures through the support of dictionaries, archives and programming at tribal institutions. Native American history is a crucial element of our national story. NEH also funds discussion groups, oral history projects, and other educational programming to help the general public learn from military veterans and to aid their transition back into civilian life. This year also marks the 100th anniversary of women winning the right to vote in the United States. NEH is highlighting the 19th Amendment by funding a series of 26 short films about extraordinary American women. We also funded a forthcoming documentary film on the suffrage movement to air on PBS. In all of this, NEH is inspired by the words of Abraham Lincoln, who rightfully claimed that our nation is the last best hope of Earth. From preserving the papers of the founders 
to presenting the speeches of Martin Luther King Jr. NEH is helping Americans of all ages learn about our nation's remarkable history. The abolitionist Frederick Douglass wrote, quote, a great battle lost or won is easily described, understood, and appreciated, but the moral growth of a great nation requires reflection as well as observation to appreciate it. It is our duty to support the moral and intellectual growth of our youth, to point the way for the next generation of Americans so that they too can live meaningful, impactful, fulfilling lives. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Solom, uh, Professor of Geography at Texas State University and Senior Advisor for Geography Education at the American Association of Geographers. Thank you for inviting me to share some of the work that we're doing at the AAG to improve geography education. Uh, every young American deserves an opportunity to learn geography as part of a well-rounded education. So why is that important? Consider the context. Young people today go to school during a time of massive global change driven by human activity. Transformations in Earth's climate, biodiversity, and land cover are so widespread that many scientists argue we have entered a new era in the planet's history, the Anthropocene, or age of humans. Yet there are deeply troubling signs in the latest geography report card that students are ill-equipped to grasp the nature of serious geographical problems, from global climate change to pandemics such as COVID-19. The declines in geography achievement come at a time when demand for geographic knowledge and skills is rising and rising fast. Companies and governments increasingly rely on spatial data for making decisions. Technologies that map these data now serve a major function in the economy, science, and society. Yet NAEP reports that students are not learning geography at a level that is necessary to satisfy workforce needs in geography and geospatial related industries. The good news is that we have important sources of data at our disposal to better understand how we can improve geographic learning in schools. Thanks to an investment by the AAG in Texas State, we have a National Center for Research and Geography Education that coordinates research activities across the nation. Recently, the center received a grant from the National Science Foundation and a license from the Institute of Education Sciences to analyze restricted use NAEP data. These rich data sets will enable us to probe more deeply into the role of teacher time, teacher training, technology access, and other factors that may potentially explain patterns in geography achievement. Over the past 25 years, NAEP has informed us repeatedly that geography achievement scores are especially low among minority students. We also know more confident learners score higher on a geography assessment. Research suggests confidence to do science can be increased among all learners by teaching the applications and relevance of science to everyday life and wider society. This is exactly what we're trying to do in our powerful geography initiative with the help of teachers, professional geographers, and employer organizations. Let's watch a brief video of two social studies educators discussing powerful geography. Powerful geography seems to align really well with the ultimate goal, which is to prepare students for the careers that they're going to find themselves competing for in a few years when they graduate. The advantage with powerful geography is that connection to authentic application of the content. It's connecting it to how they would practice it in the field and how it works in real life is critical for them to be able to take that information and transfer it and to apply it in different settings. According to a government report citing NAEP, access to geography in schools is limited by variations in state requirements and pressure to teach other subjects. Nonetheless, many states do encourage integrated social studies instruction. An excellent example is the GeoCivics project led by one of our center's grantees, Dr. Rebecca Theobald. GeoCivics is an interactive learning program that uses an online mapping tool to allow participants to create their own electoral districts equipping teachers to prepare students to ask questions of legislators or members of independent commissions who will work with cartographers to redraw district maps. We are also linking geography with STEM subjects. 
Many careers in the geospatial services industry require knowledge of both geography and computer science, which are usually taught separately. With funding from NSF, the AAG's Encoding Geography Initiative is piloting a research practitioner partnership in California to develop inclusive curricula supporting combined geographic and computational thinking. Pictured here is Encoding Geography's founder, Dr. Colleen Doni, with some of our collaborators from the Sweetwater Union High School District, San Diego State University, California Geographic Alliance, and the University of California at Riverside. The AAG's GeoMentors program, under the direction of Dr. Candace Luberman, provides an infrastructure for scaling up encoding geography and similar initiatives to the national level. GeoMentors are volunteers who help K-12 schools, teachers, and informal education groups introduce GIS and geographic concepts to students using free cloud GIS software donated by Esri. To date, over 2,000 volunteers and nearly 8,000 schools have joined the program. To wrap up, geography is an essential knowledge and skill set for our future citizens, leaders, and emerging workforce. In light of the setbacks in the latest NAEP geography report card, we must bolster our investments in geography education. Future NAEP assessments will be important because without them, we will be unable to say definitively whether our nation is making progress toward geographic literacy. I'd like to end by thanking my colleagues, Colleen Doni, Michelle Kinzer, Thomas Larson, and Lisa Seamus for their contributions to this presentation. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Bagian, and I have the privilege of serving as Assistant State Superintendent and Chief Academic Policy Officer here in Louisiana at our Department of Education. Today, I want to talk to you a bit about our plan, which we call Louisiana Believes, and the ways in which we are trying to do a more um, concentrated effort at bringing all of these important social studies uh, components and knowledge into our curriculum and into our assessment in a more robust way. Our plan in Louisiana is grounded on the very simple principle that our students are as smart and capable as any in the country. And we have seen strong gains from this plan. But we know that we have more to do. Uh, we are working toward a day when every student is on grade level for the next level of study. Our students have robust access to opportunities. We have robust supports for our schools that are struggling. And families have accurate information about the choices and learning opportunities in front of them. Specifically to achieve that vision, we are focused on building classrooms where every day children build knowledge of the world, including so many of the important topics that have been discussed today. They're reading meaningful text, again, so many mentioned today, expressing ideas through writing and speaking, and solving complex problems as the world demands. In order to achieve that set of actions in classrooms all across Louisiana, we have worked very hard to build a coherent and aligned academic system. At the heart of that, of course, is strong standards, but also strong curriculum use, knowledge-rich curriculum that pulls on not just uh, English language arts uh, standards, but deep study of social studies content, alignment to professional development, and of course, aligned assessments. Again, we've seen strong progress over the past uh, years, particularly since 2009, we've seen uh, strong progress in our NAEP results as well as a number of other academic measures. However, we know that there is more to do. And so as we confront the challenging results from the presentation today, as well as our own data in Louisiana, we are trying to take our work to the next level and further bring together the standards and curriculum with our assessment through the innovative assessment pilot allowed under ESSA. So specifically, we start from this place as um, the, imp the importance of has been imparted on by so many of the speakers today. And that is, it is our job as educators to impart knowledge of the world on our students so that they are ready to be engaged, informed citizens upon graduation. We believe in Louisiana that is best done through the use of strong curriculum. As part of an effort to strengthen the curriculum options in Louisiana, 
we many years ago began building what we call ELA guidebooks, what nationally is often called LearnZillion. This is a very rich, knowledge rich, robust ELA curriculum uh, built by teachers for teachers with a green rating on Ed Reports uh, that is used in 75% of classrooms across Louisiana. This curriculum not only speaks to the English language arts standards, but increasingly integrates with our social studies standards and necessary learnings there, again, to confront the challenges that we're discussing today. The challenge before us, though, and the, the way in which we're trying to continue this work under the Innovative Assessment Pilot uh, is to better bring together our assessment in alignment with what our standards and curriculum call for our children to know in order to be strong, engaged citizens. Specifically, our test currently, like so many ELA assessments across the country, measures skills. And it implicitly measures knowledge. Um, and that's a real challenge that we're trying to confront for two reasons. First, in this knowledge-rich curriculum, which has great texts that are worth deep study, we are hearing from 95% of our teachers that though they stay and use this high quality curriculum, they often feel at least um, occasionally pulled toward doing more um, pulled passage reads and having students respond to those. And they're doing that because English language arts assessments across America, which are often the heart of accountability systems and assessment systems, often ask us to have students reading text that are divorced from the daily learnings of their classroom. The challenge of that first is that it incentivizes teachers to veer from those knowledge rich curricula and to spend their times perhaps practicing random passages rather than studying the incredibly important topics that have been named by so many speakers today. And the second challenge is, of course, that there are potential inequities within this. As you all probably know, there was a very famous study about reading and baseball. I believe this was done in 1988. And what it did was sort kids based on their previously determined reading levels, as well as their previously determined knowledge of baseball. And what probably will not surprise you is that students who knew a lot about baseball, actually regardless of their reading level, did quite well. I raise this here because if we really want to think about a future America, where our teachers are incentivized to give our children access to knowledge about our country and the world. And if we want to make sure that we have accurate measures of what all of our children know, not just those of greatest means, we feel it's really important that we think about the role of assessments in changing that practice. In Louisiana, that looks like the creation of a humanities assessment. We started in seventh grade. We are now building out sixth and through eighth and hope to expand from there. This is a through year assessment that relies directly on the text and related text to those that students are studying in class. This is possible because 75% of our teachers are using the same high quality curriculum in those grades. And that, sub, and that curriculum integrates our social studies content. We are excited about this pilot. There is a lot left to learn but we approach with urgency the challenge that's been named on this webinar today and are optimistic about the ability for those of us who are leaders in the measurement space to innovate in the ways that we measure in order to incentivize the right actions. Again, our core goals being here to reinforce the best practices of staying focused and deep in text in order to build knowledge. And second, making sure that we have a level playing field for all children, regardless of circumstance. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shalina Warren, and I am a social studies teacher at Dunbar High School in Washington, D.C. I am smiling today because I get to focus my teaching efforts on civic engagement in order to counter the discouragement that many of my students face as teenagers. I love my students so much, and my pictures you see in the background are an extension of that love as I use them to collect our memories together but to also have evidence of everything we do. I want my students to see the changes they have made as they become more active citizens, physically and socially. Come with me on a quick journey rooted in student civic experiences. Welcome to Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School. Don't let this beautiful building built in 2013 fool you. Our school has a rich legacy. 
Eleanor Holmes Norton, one of our famous alumni, is the namesake for our Law and Public Policy Academy. We teach our students that their voices matter by supporting them in a range of community action initiatives, many requiring students to engage with stakeholders while showing them what organized, intentional action and community improvement looks like. On this cold fall day, my students help to beautify our beloved school grounds with our gloves, trash bags, and energetic spirit, which was one of our concerns in our local community. Many of my students think they are too young to enact change and as a result are not empowered. Our academy serves as a vehicle to expose students to problem solving and communication skills through experiential learning. Enter Jahara Brockington, an academy law leader who doubted herself a lot until she realized she could do anything she wanted. According to youth.gov, civic engagement is working to make a difference in the civic life of one's community. Our academy nurtures students who are actively involved in their community using their voice to affect change. Jahara won a trip to San Francisco for winning a national Facebook competition for her community action project on reinstating the right to vote to elect a convicted felon. For the past three years, the Dunbar Law and Public Policy Academy has partnered with the Paul Weiss Law Firm in DC to prepare our students for future legal careers. Volunteers from the law firm teach classroom lessons, and then students are invited to the law firm to participate in a legal conference where they are challenged with the mock trial or debate activities uh, that promote critical thinking skills, which is one of the pillars of our academy. Students leave excited about the different opportunities law firms could present for them. Many of my students are not regularly exposed to opportunities like this, which helps them see themselves in spaces they would never imagine. The Dunbar Law and Public Policy Academy partners with MICFA Challenge DC. Participation in civic engagement activities can help youth become better informed about current events. One of those experiences was participation in the Get Out the Vote campaign in Manassas, Virginia in which a few of our academy students met up at a local candidate's headquarters, received training in materials, and were sent off to knock on doors to get potential voters to the polls on the upcoming primary election. On this cold and windy November day, not only did we meet new people, we went away with a feeling of accomplishment that we had helped people. I present one of our academy leaders, Larry Hyman. A group of MICVA Challenge DC teachers are being introduced to the Project Soapbox competition, and Larry's speech is one of the examples chosen to highlight the power of student voice. Larry spoke up about gun violence, an emotional and heartbreaking subject that affects his daily life. It isn't until after I have them write speeches or participate in civic fairs that involve community members listening to them that they realize that they too can make change. People will listen. This picture is proof of that, if nothing else. The first issue we focused on in our academy was police brutality. We surveyed the school community and many had been impacted by police brutality. We created an educational and letter writing campaign. Then we connected with MPD police officers for a round table discussion about community relations. The common denominator was fear because once the police officers and students started talking, they realized they had more things in common than not. Having students and police officers talk to one another and develop empathy and respect for each other was powerful. One of our academy pillars is for students to know their rights. Two of our academy law leaders, Richard Bangura and Larry Hyman, represented our academy in the Find Your Balance Challenge. During this one day event modeled after the show Shark Tank, they won $4,000 for our school for their student leadership program called All Rise, where student leaders become translators between the school administration and the student body as they work to provide more exposure opportunities for our students via enriching experiences off campus and productive meetings on campus. The grant money will be used to help give students a sense of identity and community. 
These young men lived out one of our academy pillars because they enacted change at Dunbar. Daria Boyd, one of my law leaders, has rewarded us with a type of poetic justice thanks to her linguistic gift. Here she is being recorded as a featured speaker for Discovery Education's Constitution Day programming in which she was interviewed as well as wrote and performed her own poem about student voice. And I quote, we the people in order to have a more perfect union must use our voice. In the US, our right to speak is protected. Our right to freely speak is the first thing that's mentioned. Yet we the people have gone silent, end quote. She uses her gifts of writing and speaking to affect change. Since I have known her, she has lived up to the academy pillar of using your voice for the betterment of society. We are fortunate enough to partner with Georgetown Law School to immerse our students in real world experiences. Students sit in a law class and a law professor spends time with them going over what life is like in law school. Then students interact with each other to compete um, with problem solving tasks that involves um, them analyzing and determining faults in an ethical legal case. A discussion ensues and students end up taking sides in the case. Uh, those were good times. Experiences such as this is one way we continue to uphold the academy pillar of students being mentally and socially prepared for life after high school. Welcome to the Honorable Congresswoman's Eleanor Holmes Norton's office. A few of our students, including Keith Fire Polite, whom you see here, spoke, spoke with Norton's staff assistant after attending the lobby weekend for atrocity prevention with STAND, the student-led movement to end mass atrocities. We made our way to Capitol Hill to lobby Congress for support to help end these atrocities overseas. Not only do we work to improve our local communities, we also want to improve global communities. Her staff assistant took us to see Ms. Norton as she was holding a press conference on the lawn of the Capitol building. To actually see democracy in action for our students was priceless. We asked students to think of their ideal school and then we brainstormed why we didn't have the ideal school now. From that discussion, we created our Action Civics Fair project topic, Peer Court, Solutions to Misbehavior. This idea fit perfectly with our academy pillar that students should be empowered to learn from their experiences instead of being punished for them. So we presented this project at Mikva Challenge DC's Action Civics Fair, meeting many community members, including city council members. Richard, you see here, is discussing our project with the president of Mikva Challenge, Brian Brady. Many people supported this idea of having a pure court that would hear certain student cases and provide another discipline alternative that would benefit all students in the long run. After the Academy, after the Action Civics Fair, Richard's class divided up into student committees to survey the school community. The surveys indicated there was a need for this initiative. So our next step was to pull school discipline statistics and schedule a town hall meeting to discuss the peer court idea with the larger school body. Many ideas and suggestions sprung out of this conversation. We gathered data from each town hall participant with a questionnaire. Our students affirmed we should focus on peer court as being an actual component of our school. We were ready to conduct trial runs of our peer court pilot program when we were approached by iCivics. My students helped co-design our own peer-to-peer -peer court. Inspired by the iCivics game, We the Jury, our students served as lawyers, judges, and jurors and heard cases from classmates. Excited by this innovative approach, Soledad O'Brien featured the project in one of her matter-of-fact show segments. It was evident that putting students in the driver's seat is beneficial on so many levels because the court was created, run, and depended solely on academy students, as you can see from our picture. They became the true leaders and innovators we know they could be. Talk about positive student change. Fast forward to our progress today. 
created a training manual and recruitment plan for our peer court program. We met with school officials to get approval and a commitment to have peer court as an official program at Dunbar for next year. I used my peer mediation class to begin training for our peer court so we could begin to hear cases this spring. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, we cannot always build a future for our youth, but we can always build our youth for the future. By creating more civic-minded students in our high schools, we will not only create habits that can be sustained into adulthood, but it can provide immediate results, such as increasing students' sense of self. I hope you enjoyed this civic journey you were led on today. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jeffrey Rosen, and I am the president of the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia. It's such an honor to talk with you today about the urgent importance of helping Americans of all ages educate themselves about the Constitution and our founding principles in this challenging time. As John P.D. so eloquently said, quoting Jefferson, America cannot survive ignorant and free. And the National Constitution Center stands ready to be a shining beacon of light for Americans of all ages and backgrounds as they educate themselves about our Constitution and founding principles. The Constitution Center was founded as a private nonprofit during the bicentennial of the Constitution, and it was given an inspiring mission by the US Congress to disseminate information about the Constitution on a nonpartisan basis to increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people. And I'm so excited to have this chance to tell you about the amazing remote learning opportunities that we've launched that both before and after the COVID crisis have made the Constitution Center America's leading platform for nonpartisan civics education. So here you can see a picture of the Constitution Center. It's this inspiring building on Independence Mall right across from Independence Hall, the most sacred constitutional ground in America. But the Constitution Center is also an idea uh, and that idea is rooted in an online platform we've launched called the Interactive Constitution. The Interactive Constitution brings together the leading liberal and conservative scholars in America to write about every clause of the Constitution, describing what they agree about and what they disagree about. It is thrilling to see these common statements, which are like unanimous Supreme Court opinions that citizens of all perspectives can embrace. The interactive constitution has been so successful that it's gotten more than 30 million hits since it launched in 2015. As a result, the Constitution Center is now the most, the fifth most visited museum website in America and the seventh most visited museum website in the world. Because as Americans of all ages turn to get trusted, balanced answers about constitutional questions, they are finding this amazing online tool. But that's not all. I always feel like a Ginsu knife salesman when I talk about the Interactive Constitution because I'm so excited about the resources that it includes. The Interactive Constitution includes videos with Supreme Court Justices Elena Kagan and Neil Gorsuch and the leading scholars in America about all provisions of the Constitution. It includes an amazing provision called the drafting table where you can explore early drafts of every constitutional provision. It includes the weekly podcast that I host that bring together America's leading liberal and conservative scholars to discuss constitutional issues in the news, such as those related to the Constitution and the COVID crisis. In all of these learning materials, the Constitution Center follows a rigorous uh, approach. We ask citizens to separate your political from your constitutional views. I'm a law professor. I teach at George Washington Law School, and I tell learners of all ages just what I tell my students. Don't ask what you think the government should do when you're learning about the Constitution, but what you think the Constitution allows or forbids it to do. And by separating your political from your constitutional views, you can elevate yourself above partisan politics and make up your mind about what the Constitution allows or forbids. Friends, I'm so excited to share that since the COVID crisis, the Constitution Center has launched an exciting new series of online courses. I just taught one today at 1 p.m. I've been teaching them along with our dynamic chief learning officer, Curry Sautner, every 
Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday at uh, 1 p.m. And these classes are getting, they've attracted more than 15,000 students since they launched just a few weeks ago, showing the incredible hunger that there is for this nonpartisan content. A session with Ken Burns, the filmmaker, brought 2,000 students. Yesterday, we talked to Eric Foner, the, the leading historian of Reconstruction at Columbia University. 1,500 students signed into that. And in each of these classes, I look into the Zoom camera and tell the students exactly what I'm telling you. Let's separate our political from our constitutional views. Let's begin with the constitutional text. Let's look at how it evolved over time. Let's hear what the Supreme Court has said about it, and I always urge the students to read the majority opinions as well as the dissents so that you can hear the best arguments on both sides. There was a wonderful moment in one of our early classes when one of our students uh, tweeted in the chat box, hi, I'm Oliver, I'm only 12, I'm not sure I can understand the dissents. But he could and he did, and we had a great discussion about the arguments on both sides there. So what these uh, online classes have convinced me and my colleagues is that there is a hunger in this country for balanced, trusted content. There is an audience for it, and now we have a platform for it, and it's called the Interactive Constitution, and it is free and online, and any citizen can learn from it, can click on any of the 80 clauses of the Constitution and find this amazing wealth of material with the videos and the explainers and the early drafts, and now the opportunity to sign up for live classes, as well as constitutional exchanges that can link classrooms across the country for live discussions about the Constitution, moderated by my colleagues and uh, me, and also by judges and master teachers. What an amazing opportunity this new technology gives us to spread all of this constitutional light during a time of challenge. The Constitutional Ambassadors Program you see here can bring students to the Constitution Center for real-time learning, but increasingly we're finding during this remote learning time that these classroom exchanges will provide an opportunity for real-time learning about the Constitution that will enrich uh, classes of all ages uh, long after uh, the crisis has passed. We're going to continue to offer these classes so that anyone in the country and teachers, if you are listening, go to constitutioncenter.org and sign up your students now, whether they're learning at home or learning at school, and you will find balanced, trusted content that is sponsored by both the conservative Federalist Society and the progressive American Constitution Society, ensuring you of the nonpartisan reliability of all of this wonderful material. Friends, uh, my colleagues and I are crusaders for constitutional education. We are on a mission, and that mission is to inspire learners of all ages, not only learners from K through 12, or perhaps middle school through 12, although there's, you can't start too early, but also adult learners who can sign on to the podcast and also sign on to the thrilling live town hall program, such as the one about a debate about the history and meaning of the Electoral College yesterday that got 750 live people signing up at noon because they were so hungry to get those good arguments. And all of it is rooted in the interactive constitution and rooted in this crucially important idea that we rigorously view these matters in a nonpartisan way and separate our political from our constitutional views. These numbers that you see here, the slides were prepared at the beginning of the crisis. As I say, these numbers have now doubled to more than 15. I think we're now at about um, nearly 20,000 with the uh, uh, recent events this week. This is a movement, and I want to invite all of you to join it and to sign up, and all of us are doing our part, all of the great partners you're hearing from. What inspiring stories are told by Shalila and Michael and Jessica and, 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 and John and the uh, NEH are doing such a superb job in inspiring everyone to pull together to beat the drum for civics and to make this a national crusade. There are many things that divide this country right now, but there's one thing that unites us, and that is our founding principles rooted in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the need to learn about them and debate them in a nonpartisan way. So I will just end by urging you to join us, to connect with us, go to constitutioncenter.org, sign up for the classes, go to the interactive constitution and educate yourself about the constitution. And I'll just end with the inspiring words that I always find so galvanizing of Justice Louis Brandeis. If we would govern ourselves by the light of reason, we must let our minds be bold. Thanks so much and thank you for educating yourself about the U.S. Constitution.
Thank you very, very much uh, to all of our incredible panelists. Uh, special thank you to the technology team behind the scenes working through these things. We have received several questions, and we are going to do our best to get through as many as possible in the last five, perhaps even seven minutes of the presentation. Let me start with uh, John and uh, Jeff. Um, your passion is incredible, uh, and it's coming through uh, for both of you. One of our questions was, what additional partners would you like to see um, also advocating alongside you uh, in terms of getting access, good quality access to geography, to history, to civics education? What partners would you like to see uh, connect? I send that question to John and Jeff. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, one pleasure of awarding grants is there are no shortage of partners. And uh, so there are a number of organizations that focus in the K-12 environment that we work with. Uh, and I would note that I don't think we always think as educators about the importance of the museum world. Uh, we know, for example, for college, the importance of the American Historical Association but I think for many of us that fell in love with history as young people, it was because of a librarian and because of a museum. So I would say that as much as we can, if our schools will make sure that they have connections with larger cultural organizations, uh, such as the Constitution Center, I think that would go a long way about creating a diverse learning environment. Thank you. And Thank you so much, John, for urging schools to reach out to the Constitution Center and, and, and come to us physically if you can. And I, and I would echo John's call to schools. The partner that the Constitution Center most needs is teachers, all the brilliant, inspiring teachers like uh, Shalina and others um, are the ones who will ensure that students sign on to the online classes and use the interactive Constitution. So it really it's an opportunity. We have this free resource, and we've just got to. We need your help, teachers, in spreading the word. So whether it's at the uh, school district level, where we're working, for example, with Dr. William Height, the superintendent of schools in Philadelphia, and also with uh, the Charter Schools Association, with parochial schools, we've got to get this material to underserved communities. And the main thing to do is just to help us. Uh, reach those students and teachers. So if you are a teacher or an administrator or a principal who's listening right now, reach out to me at the Constitution Center, reach out to uh, Curry Sautner and help us connect to you. What we, uh, like so many of the great grantees of NEH and the great uh, schools and uh, organizations here, we're all doing this great work. We need your help in distributing it. And uh, I know that you'll do that. Thank you so much for helping us spread the word and spread the light. Thank you very, very much. Um, our next question, I think, goes to Jessica and uh, Shalina. Both of you have been very passionate and are advocating for more complex, more experiential um, learning inside of our classrooms, right along with all of the facts and knowledge. And we have a question here that asks, what do we face at the state level and the classroom level? Um, what are our biggest challenges in trying to improve our civics and history uh, curriculum? Uh, I'll jump in first. Um, uh, thank you for the question. I would say for us, um, we, we want to support great teachers like Shalina to be able to create the sort of environments that she described earlier for children all across Louisiana, as well as in DC. Um, and the biggest way for us to get to scale on that is to provide knowledge rich curriculum as a base for her, her and her colleagues to work from um, and to build lessons um, from in their classrooms. Um, in doing that, we're at great scale, as I mentioned before, um, over 95% of classrooms now use a tier one curriculum, 75% of English language arts are using the same curriculum in Louisiana. But the second challenge we ran into is that often the assessment was um, incentivizing some, many good actions, but some actions that were deterring teachers from staying deep in the text and doing the sort of knowledge building activities that she so thoughtfully described earlier. And so for us, this is about 
reinforcing and supporting high quality curriculum, but also making sure that our assessments and professional development align to that to reinforce the best teacher actions on behalf of building knowledge for all children. And to piggyback off of this great question, um, just simply administrators and other leaders of, in the district and state level to encourage teachers and support teachers to go outside of the classroom for learning. Learning just doesn't happen within those four walls. It's everywhere. And many times if you, as we said earlier, making connections, if we can connect our curriculum to what is going outside of the classroom, the kids will get it. They want to be a part of it. They'll see the relevance of it. Um, just opening up the door for more uh, freedom of teachers to expand the curriculum and to be creative in how they are able to reach the students based on how they learn. Thank you. Thank you very much. So our last question, I cannot believe time has gone so fast and so far, but our last question actually goes to Michael. And this is actually, I think, um, harkening back to some questions we heard earlier about relevancy um, and also career planning. So Michael, you are actually a senior advisor for geography and you, you teach in that space. What have you seen as the biggest challenges and the best successes in helping to make the subject matter relevant uh, to students, um, not just in the classroom, but also in terms of considering careers related to geography. And feel free to expand actually to history and civics as well. Well, thanks for the question. Uh, and thanks to everyone who presented today. I learned a lot and it's really exciting and I hope we continue these conversations. Um, the question of relevancy of content you know, we all we all want geography to be taught in an academically rigorous way, right? We want the content to be strong. That's why we have standards. But I'm wondering, moving forward, we need to also do a little bit more work in terms of academic content that's rigorous, but that students perceive to be relevant, uh, students perceive to be significant, uh, students generate students interest gives them confidence to do geography and that approach i think has to originate from the student context we got to draw from work in curriculum theory that points to the importance of context and relating our instruction to students communities their sense of culture heritage um, and then turn to people that who actually have expertise in our subject areas, and that would be our professionals, the graduates from our uh, academic programs. They do amazing things. They do amazing things in their work. They do amazing things in their private lives as citizens, in which they use their disciplinary knowledge uh, to make a difference. And I think if we can draw some examples of how that's at work in local communities, um, that can help provide teachers with sort of curriculum guidance of how they can support standards-based education, but do it in a way that we, th we think may uh, have more resonance among the learners. Um, I think many of the techniques that were described by the presenters today have so much potential uh, to assist in that, in that goal. So um, I think we just need to recommit to getting back to work, collecting data, evaluating what we do, and share what we learn so that we hopefully uh, have a better report card <laughs> next time. <we're... laughs> thank, you. thank you very, very much, Michael. Um, and thank you to all of, of our panelists, to, to John and Jeff and Jessica, Shalina uh, and Michael, and of course our earlier presentation. Um, I've heard things and I've heard things restated, interest, context, confidence more than just the facts. These are the kinds of things that our students are uh, engaging with and are willing to bring to the table um, as we wrap around them with this level of excitement and passion for the discussions. I know that this particular time may feel like we are making history, but the truth of the matter is we are always making history. And while we may have this poll or that poll saying that more than ever, our nation is civically engaged, the truth of the matter is we are always civically engaged and need to be engaged. And I dare say being trapped in my condo has given me a special appreciation of geography and I would like to see more of it sometime soon. So we're in a 
space of, of heightened relevance, I think, for all of, of these subjects. And I want to thank all of our panelists. I want to thank the staff and the team at NCES, as well as the staff, the team, and the board at the National Assessment Governing Board, and everyone that has, has tuned in, our teachers, our parents, our policymakers, our elected officials. Um, we are the wind beneath our students' wings. Um, there are challenging results, um, but that simply means that there is more promise ahead of us. Thank you. Please stay connected to our websites and do your own deep dive into the nation's report card so that you too can keep on top of the progress of our nation's children. Be safe, stay calm, have a good day. Mm -hmm.